my name is Mars, you can call me MG if you would like, and today I am starting my April readathons vlog because I'm partaking in three readathons. I will link my TBR video down below for you guys to check out if you want to know all the details, but otherwise I'll just be chatting about things as they come along. So, today is actually March 29th, not April 1st. I just really wanted to get started on these books, and in the grand scheme of things, what's three days? Like, we're just gonna pretend it's April now and get started on this because I want to, and none of this has any consequences, so what's the point? <laughs> Might as well start now because I'm in the mood for it. So, I have 11 books that I will be reading as part of this con... what's the word? Conflagration? I don't think that's correct. I don't even know if it's a real word. Combination. Yep, that one's definitely the real word I was going for. Uh, this combination of readathons has gotten me 11 books to read, and I thought very long and hard about what I wanted to start today. I first was like, I think I'm in the mood for an ebook, so that only knocked out three books, because I only have three physical books on this TBR. Technically it knocked out four books, because one of the books I will actually be listening to as an audiobook. I'm not an audiobook girly, but I'm like, you know what? We're gonna venture out. This one's not even non-fiction. It is a fiction book, so definitely out of my comfort zone when it comes to audiobooks, but I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. So I'm not doing it right now, but I will get to that. So I had, what is it, like seven books to choose between, and I've been thinking long and hard about them, and I narrowed it down to two. The two that I narrowed it down to are uh, Beautiful Nightmares by K.J. Sutton, which is the fourth book in the Fortuna Sworn series, or uh, Like a River Glorious by Ray Carson, which is the second book in the Gold Seer trilogy. And I'm like, you know, these are the two that I'm really in the mood for. I kind of can't decide between the two of them. So then I looked at the page length and that, that decided it for me. So on Goodreads, the page length for Beautiful Nightmares says it's like 600 something pages in the ebook version. Everend says it's 900 something, and I don't know where those 300 page discrepancy came from, but like 600 pages is still a lot, 900 pages is definitely a lot, a lot. Like a River Glorious is just under 400 pages, I think it's like 380 something, and that feels much more doable. So that decided it for me. The first book I will be starting is Like a River Glorious. Like I said, this is the second book in the Gold Seer trilogy which follows our main character, Leah, during the American Gold Rush. She can sense gold when it's, like, around her, whether it's in the ground or someone's jewelry, anything like that. She can, like, pinpoint where it is, basically. And the first book followed her journey across the country to California, where the epicenter of the Gold Rush happened. And I'm very excited to see where this second book takes us because I really, really enjoyed the first one. And so I'm going to start that tonight and I will come back and update you once I've gotten a good chunk into it. Hello friends, it is 9 p.m. on the 30th and I'm here to give you my first update on Like a River Glorious. I stopped like halfway through a chapter to do this update because I'm like, I'm literally about to start crying. Oh my God, I was going to update you after the last chapter because so much stuff happened. This whole like first section has been so action-packed, which I I don't remember much from the first book in the way of like pacing and stuff. I remember it was wonky somehow, but I don't remember, I think. So I read the first book back in August actually for Aurelium, the magical readathon which I remembered as I started reading. I'm like, wait a minute, this was for a prompt. But um, I remember, I'm pretty sure the first book was very action-packed, act one, and then kind of like slower, act two, and then very action-packed, act three. And this seems to be following suit because act one is so full of things like, we had someone getting shot in chapter one, he's fine. But then, I don't even know what number chapter I'm on, like seven, maybe? These are like slightly longer chapters, but the last chapter that I finished, I 
read it and then I'm like, I want to update, but I'm like, I'm on page 95, I'll read another chapter so that I can say I've passed 100 pages. But that chapter, the characters are all like running around panicking because the camp has been set on fire and all of this stuff happens. And then this chapter, they find one of their people so they're they have guards like they set watches um so that the camp is like not totally unaware and the one person they found he was unconscious back behind a shed that was on fire and they managed to pull him away from it and then go wake everyone else up to like help fix things and he's okay he's got a really bad concussion but he doesn't live and everything. And they found the other person who was on a on the guard duty watch, whatever, and he's dying. <laughs> and I'm so sad. He says that he hit got hit in the back of the head and like fell off a small cliff. And when they find him, the back of his head is like completely smashed. Like his skull is broken through and his one leg is bent at a really horrible angle but he can't even feel it and like you can see I'm starting to to cry now because oh, I don't want to spoil it but like there's reasons why this character is hitting me harder than if it had been another character dying because I don't cry I'm like a cry baby I, I cry no matter what strong emotion I get but like Character deaths don't usually hit me because I write my own stories and I understand that sometimes a character has to die, but this one, mm, it's it's really getting to me, and the 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 one guy. So there's they have like a doctor in their group. I'm like trying to form sentences and I can't. They have a doctor in their group, sort of. He was studying medicine at school, but I don't think he's like an actual doctor. And he's training... I don't know if you can hear that, but I guess there's a truck backing up outside. Um, he's training this one girl, this little girl, Olive, who... I don't even know how old she is. I thought she was like seven, which she could be. But he's like training her in medicine and stuff because she seemed really interested in it like he was teaching her um how to stitch someone's cut that they had stuff like that and he like has her lean over their dying companion and be like do you hear like that sound when he breathes and she's like yeah it sounds really wet and he's like we're gonna talk about that later and i'm like oh my god <laughs> like this is really getting to me <laughs> but um I'm enjoying the book, but like, clearly it's having an effect on me because I care about these characters. But also, there was a moment in the chapter with the fire where there's something that happens that hints that maybe this person like betrayed them somehow. So that's like when they go out to find him, they think he's done this thing, but then He's telling a story about how he got like hit in the back of the head and fell off this cliff and like I don't know what's gonna happen and so like I gotta keep reading. Oh, I, I literally stopped in the middle of a chapter. I, I like I'm like I need to update my vlog but oh boy and this is only the first book of 11 that I'm reading for this vlog and I'm already basically crying so we're doing great guys but I've been rambling long enough. I'm gonna go now and I will be back when I have a second, hopefully better update about Like a River Glorious. Hello friends, it is 11am on the 31st and I promise I was making every intention to update you before I finished this book, but uh, I finished Like a River Glorious. It was so good. When I tell you that this is a contender for like favorite book of the year, Oh my god, was this book fantastic. Um, I ended up reading so much last night after I updated you. I stayed up probably later than I should have, but I don't regret it. 
I had about 150 pages left to read this morning, so I slept in a little bit because I did stay up, and then I got out of bed to feed the cats, and then got right back into bed to keep reading, and I just finished the book, came out here, just like I got update the vlog. Um, yeah, this was so good. I, I know that a lot of trilogies suffer from the middle book slump, where the, the middle book kind of lags and isn't as exciting as the first or third book, but like, this was so much better than the first one, and the first one was pretty dang good, as far as I remember. Like, obviously I enjoyed it enough to want to continue the series, but like, this was fantastic. So the first book was Lee or Leah, her name is Leah, but in the first book she disguises herself as a boy so that she can easily well not easily but it'd be easier to travel from her home in Georgia to California along the Oregon Trail easier as a boy than as a girl so that's what she's doing and it has like some commentary there like there's a lot of commentary on the treatment of Native Americans by the American government because um Leah's best friend Jefferson is half Cherokee and it's very prominent in the first book and we still have that in the second book. I think we have that even more so because we see the enslavement of Native American people to work in these gold mines and then we also see more of this atrocity. We have um like obviously black people were enslaved at this time because the civil war hadn't happened yet and we see that though that's definitely less prevalent than the other things we see we also touch on the chinese immigration that was happening at this time in american history and we get to see specifically the treatment of chinese women and at the end of the book there's an author's note and the author talks about how if you're going to write historical fiction you have to do your research and she talks about all of the sources that she used and the people that she talked to who would have more knowledge on this, more experience. Like she has Native American people and Chinese people who studied this sort of thing and hold these degrees and have this knowledge and she went to them for information. And it was just a really good thing to see that because as far as I'm aware, the author is white. I haven't like done research into Ray Carson, but I saw a picture of her and I would assume she's white just based on that picture. And just the hard work and everything that she put into making this as accurate as possible is so good to see because I know so many people who wouldn't put that kind of effort into this and they wouldn't care. But um, it's kind of sad because you really, if you're creating a story like this, you should want it to be accurate and get that information from people who would know better than you, you know? So yeah, it was just really good to see that. And I feel like that's also a really strong theme in this book is the kind of blindness white people can have towards racism even when they know it's going on. like. Leah knows that this is awful what's happening to these people that she sees in front of her and yet she still messes up and has these moments where she's maybe not thinking correctly about it but she's making the effort to fix that and I think that's a really good message even today like you have to work to overcome the things that have been ingrained in you from birth basically being in a society like this like there's one moment where so i don't want to spoil i will spoil a little bit but not like plot stuff just general things she ends up at this gold mine owned by her uncle who is the big bad of the first and second book and she is kept there against her will because of her gold sense that she has her uncle is using it in order to get this gold to pay back this debt that he owes and she's talking to her two friends who were captured along with her one being her friend Jefferson who is the half Cherokee boy and then this other man who is a white man he's a college educated lawyer but he like gets 
caught up in this. And then there is, um, I guess he's kind of like a foreman of the mines, but like not a high ranking one because he is Native American. And then there is this Chinese woman, Mary, and they're all talking and she's like, I'm a prisoner here just like you. And, um, I don't remember which one of the, which character said it, but one of them is like, no, you may be a prisoner, but it's not anything like what we're going through. You have all these fine clothes, you're fed, you get to sleep in a bed, you have all of these privileges. And she's like, damn, you're right. I have to check myself on that. And like, this book came out, so the first book I think was 2015, so I'm assuming this was 2016, and I feel like that was kind of a progressive thought to put in a book like this at that time. Like, obviously there was stuff like this being put in books all along, but YA books have come such a long way, and I feel like this is just so well done, and I am insanely excited to finish out this trilogy and see what happens because we've tied up a very large plot and like they've hinted at what the third book is going to be loosely about so uh, I really can't wait this is this is a fantastic start to this vlog this month of reading for these readathons ooh um I should pull out my reading journal so I can tell you what this book was for. So I have, these are my very busy spreads for these readathons. So this was not for the magical readathon. This was just for the tomes and treasures. I realize now I wrote tomes and taverns on my thing because I've been making that mistake so many times. It's tomes and treasures readathon. And this was for... Oh, this was the skill test, so I had to make a list of 20 books, roll a d20, and whatever number I rolled, that was the book I read, and I rolled an 18, and that gave me Like a River Glorious, and I'm very glad that it ended up being that, because this was so good. And I kind of want to keep going with books that I think I'm going to absolutely adore, because I'm just riding this high of reading a great book. And I think my next book is going to be Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson because I adored An Enchantment of Ravens. Vespertine, slightly less. I still really, really loved it, but An Enchantment of Ravens was just a step above in my opinion. So Sorcery of Thorns is the last novel of hers that I have to read. There is a short story novella thing that comes after it that I will read when I read Sorcery of Thorns, or I guess at some point in the future. So that will be for the Tomes and Treasures. It is my weapon prompt. Uh, my character has a quarterstaff and is a bludgeoning weapon. The prompt was like a book someone recommended to you because it's like beating someone over the head trying to get them to read it. Uh, and it is also a magical readathon prompt for my restoration class. I think the prompt was a book to get you out of a reading slump, which I'm not slumping right now. Not at all. But... I feel like that's the kind of book that would get me out of a reading slump. And now that I've been rambling for almost 10 minutes, I am going to get going. And I'm not going to start reading yet because I've been reading all morning. And I do have other things to get done today. But I will start Sorcery of Thorns at some point and hopefully be better at updating you about it. But also, if it turns out to be as good as this book was, I'm not going to stop myself from reading. Like, I will keep going. So... I will see you guys in the future at some point. Hello friends. It is just about 11 p.m. still on Sunday. I apologize for sounds that you will probably hear of my cat going crazy out in the living room, but I have read the first three chapters of uh, Sorcery of Thorns and I figured it's like a nice little taste test and I can give you a short update on my thoughts. I went into this knowing practically nothing. I knew that the main character, Elizabeth, grew up in a magical library and that something happened where she was framed or became the suspect in this big crime thing and the only person she could turn to for um, like help in clearing her name is her rival slash nemesis whose last name is Thorn and that's why it's called Sorcerer of Thorns because he's a sorcerer I guess. But um, 
Uh, yeah, that's all I knew about it. And we've seen her in this library she grew up in where they keep track of gr grimoires, which in this world are sorcery books that were made by sacrificing people to demons or something. And so she hates magic because magic means sorcerers and sorcerers are evil. And we've just met Thorn. And I thought he was going to be this, like, oh, broody, morally gray. I don't know why my camera's doing that thing again. I'm just gonna ignore it. This, like, morally gray anti-hero kind of character. But from this first impression, he's giving big Howl Pendragon from Howl's Moving Castle vibes. And I kind of really love it. So I'm very excited to see where that goes. The two characters have met. And it's very funny. She is taller than him, which, like, I love when that happens. I'm pretty sure they end up, like, romantically involved, but I'm not positive. But if they do, I really like when the female character is taller than the male character. But, um, yeah, I just I read a few chapters and I thought I'd tell you my first thoughts on it. I cannot wait to see where it goes, so I'll be doing that in the coming days, so I will see you then. Hello friends, I have hit the halfway point of Sorcery of Thorns, so I'm here to give you an update. It is like 10 something on, I don't even know what day it is, Tuesday the 2nd? Sure, that sounds correct. I think it's been a couple days since I updated you, because I haven't really been reading a ton. Uh, I did most of my reading in the past like hour and a half. I think I read maybe like 20 pages yesterday and like 20 pages this morning and then I've read like 200 this evening because I got ready for bed and then I'm like, it's only 8.30, why did I get ready for bed? And so I'm like, I might as well sit in bed and read and like, this book is so good. I'm still like a little iffy on some of the world building because you have um, what is it, like, a, a branch of the government that's sorcerers, and sorcerers get their magic from deals with demons that come from the other world is what it's called. But then you also have another branch of the government that, like, runs all the libraries and stuff that believes sorcerers are evil, and they, like, their whole purpose is to protect the world from sorcery. So I don't understand how that works. I don't understand how the main character, Elizabeth, is like, all sorcery is bad and these grimoires, which are the results of sorceress study, are bad. But also, I love the grimoires. I love all books and grimoires especially. Like, that's a little bit contradictory. Not gonna lie. Also, there was a sentence that, oh gosh, I don't remember what it was off the top of my head, but it used the cart, the word cart three times in one sentence, and I'm like, Margaret, the author is Margaret Rogerson. Margaret, what is this sentence? Anyway, other than that, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. I would not rank it as high as An Enchantment of Ravens, but I would put it above Vespertine. I don't know, I love Vespertine. There was just something about it that kept me from like loving it, loving it, you know? But I'm just really enjoying this world and these characters and I feel like I'm already kind of sad that I know that this is going to end because it's a book and books end and like I'm only halfway through. I still have 250 pages. Like why am I sad? There's also a novella after this. Like I will have more time with these characters in this world. Why am I already sad about this ending? <laughs> but I don't know. That just goes to show how how much I'm enjoying this and Margaret Rogerson has well and truly earned the spot that she has on my favorite author shelf. I will eventually get a copy of Sorcerer of Thorns and the novella that goes after it to put with Vespertine and Enchantment of Ravens because I would love to have the full set and I will buy anything else Margaret Rogerson writes, honestly. Um, but yeah, that's my update. I probably won't see you again until the end of this book unless something insane happens that I have to update you on immediately. So I will see you at some point in the future. I'm probably gonna read another couple of chapters tonight just because I really want to, but I should be getting to bed soon, so it will only be a couple of chapters. But goodbye for now, I guess.
Hello friends, it is 8 p.m. on the 3rd. I have not yet finished Sorcery of Thorns, but I have a theory that I want to share, and I want proof that this was my theory in case I'm correct about it. So, how do I say this without spoilers? It's basically, oh, Chloe has come out from under the bed because she heard me talking. Hello, ma'am. Basically, there is a map that the main character is looking at of the country, and it's got the main city in the middle. Hello, Chloe. And then there's five libraries outside of the city. There's one main library in the city, and then there's five that kind of like stick out like spokes, and four of them have been attacked already. That's the inciting incident, is the library that the main character lives at is attacked and things happen. And she's looking at this map and she's like, it reminds me of something, I just know it, but I can't think of what it is. I know what it is. Or I have a theory that I'm like 99% sure is what it's going to end up being. And that is that it's going to be a summoning circle because I have watched enough shows, read enough books where there's summonings of demons and stuff like this. This is how this world is, is there's sorcerers and they get their power from summoning demons. And it's only been like a chapter and a half since we saw a demon summoning and it's the first time the character has seen one and she's looked at this map and she's like, why is this familiar? And I think it's going to be, I don't know if there's actually pentagrams, they didn't really describe the summoning circle in detail. They kind of just said there was a summoning circle. But that's my theory, is that the bad guy is making a giant summoning circle the size of the country. So, I'm going to get back to reading. I have less than 150 pages. I mm, I might finish it tonight, but I'm also not going to be super bummed if I don't. But I will see you when it's done, and we will see if I was correct. I'm back. It's only been a few minutes. I've read like 20 pages, but I was correct. I was right, and I feel great about it. I'm realizing now I kind of spoiled things for you in my attempt to not be spoilery. I think I gave a little a little bit too much in terms of details, but um sorry about that. Can't take it back now. But um yeah, I have another um idea of what is to come in the next hundred or so pages that uh I'm not gonna spoil for you because I I don't know how to talk about it without giving details, but it's basically Chekhov's gun, which is the idea that if a gun is on the page, is in the frame of a movie, on stage in a play, the gun will go off at some point. Except in this case, it's kind of Chekhov's demon. And that's where I'll leave it. Now, for real, I'm not coming back until I finish this book, so I will see you guys then. Hello. It is 10 a.m. on the 4th. And I've just finished Sorcery of Thorns. If you can't tell, I'm very, like, frazzled by it. I read a lot yesterday, so I only had the last two chapters and the epilogue to read today, and it was, like, the big conclusion and then the falling action. So, like, the big important emotional stuff. I mean, it's all big important emotional stuff. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be in the book, but, like, you know what I mean. Oh, ugh. Where do I begin? Okay, first of all, that, um, that Chekhov's gun, Chekhov's demon thing that I said, I was correct. I picked up on the foreshadowing and I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> I feel ridiculous. Oh boy. But yeah, it happened and I cried a little bit. Just a little bit. It was like two tears, but, um, it still happened. <laughs> and then it was just so good. I don't want to spoil anything because it's the literal end of the book, but um, there's some character development that I love so good. Just a lot of representation of things that I love seeing in books, and that just makes my heart so happy. Um, I'm very mad about the end of the epilogue because it cuts out on like a big thing happening and just like done. You don't get to see if it actually worked or not. I'm like, no, give it to me. But I guess if I read the novella that comes after this, I will see if it worked or not. Which, like, 
I want so badly to read that right now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stick to my plan of reading the books for these readathons. Oh, I should get out my journal so that I can tell you what things are for. Um, so I'm not going to read Mysteries of Thorn Manor, I think is what it's called, just yet. I might... I'll read it next month. I'll give myself that, like, uh, and if I can't read it now, at least I will get to read it soon. Um, I, for my journal purposes, I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10, but just know that it's more like a 9.8, because there are two things, two, like, kind of minor things that are keeping it from being completely 100% perfect in my mind. One is something I think I talked about where there's this weird world building bit where there's a part of the government that's made entirely up of sorcerers, but then there's another part of the government whose entire job is protect the kingdom from sorcery. It just doesn't seem correct to me. It feels a little bit weird and I can't get past that. I mean, I did get past it to read the book, but like it's still bugging me. The other thing is that I, the older I get, I'm 25, I'm turning 26 in September. The older I get, the less I like reading about teenagers. Like, if it's middle grade, it's fine. Like, I don't mind reading middle grade books. And if it's books that I read when I was a teenager, um, like, I don't mind rereading those. I think it's fine. But now when I pick up YA books, I find myself aging up the characters in my brain when I can. So, like, in Enchantment of Ravens, it's on my shelf behind me that you can't see, um, that main character is 17, and I don't really like reading about 17 year olds. I think it's like 15 to 19 I'm like not really a fan of for whatever reason, but it doesn't really matter to the story that Isabel in An Enchantment of Ravens is 17. Like she could just as easily be 20 and the story wouldn't change at all. And so I kind of just can ignore it, and that's why I think An Enchantment of Ravens is 10 out of 10 perfect, because if that little thing that I don't like didn't really matter. In this book, in Sorcery of Thorns, uh, Elizabeth is 16 and Nathaniel is 18, and she's she might be 17. She's 16 at the beginning of the book, but then there's like a couple of months that pass, so she like might have turned 17, we don't really know. Um, but it's like important that they're the ages they are because the library that Elizabeth, I almost called her Isabel, Elizabeth works for has like very strict rules about when you can become an apprentice and all this stuff to become training and everything to be a wardens. And so like it matters that she's 16. And then with Nathaniel, it matters that he's 18 because he is the last of his family line and people are he's like kind of a celebrity being from one of the big sorcery families and people are like he's the most eligible bachelor like he better get married and start having kids now that he's 18 and it's just i don't like it so that's why it's like a 9.8 but like it's a 10 out of 10 so uh for my readathons for the magical readathon this was for restoration and for Tomes and Treasures, I don't know if I showed you my extremely pink and busy spreads. Tomes and Treasures, it is, where is it, down here. It's my weapon prompt for my quarterstaff, so that's fun. I think I need a break from ebooks because I've read quite a few, and normally that would mean picking up a physical book, but I actually have an audiobook on this TBR. Who am I? I'm not an audiobook girly, but I kind of want to listen to more audiobooks and try and get there. So the audiobook is The Bellwoods Game, and I picked this as an audiobook, A, because I couldn't find it as an ebook, but I wanted to read it. But also, I feel like the few audiobooks, my shirt is like laying on me weird, the few audiobooks that I've listened to just as audiobooks without reading physically have been nonfiction. And I feel like for my first foray into fiction audiobooks, I wanted something easy, so it's a middle grade, which tend to be a little bit simpler to follow along than books meant for like older age ranges. And it's also only six hours, so it's quite short. I will 
probably be listening to it a little bit faster. I don't know. Maybe. I usually listen to audiobooks at about two times speed, but because I won't be listening, I mean, I won't be reading along physically while I listen, I might slow that down to like 1.5? We'll have to see. So it won't take me the full six hours, most likely, but even if it does six hours, not that long. I could like obviously break that up. I'm not going to listen to it six hours the whole way through. Um, but I think it's a good choice for my first foray into fiction audiobooks. You know, it makes sense to me and I'm just excited for this experience and I think I've just talked myself into doing that first and then I guess afterwards I'll read a physical book just to to get one out there because I do have three on this TBR but um yeah I guess I've just decided here with you that my next read is going to be The Bellwoods Game. I don't remember who this is by but I'll have the cover on screen for you to see and this is also for both um readathons it is my art of illusion uh pick for magical readathon and it is my upbringing pick for the tomes and treasures because uh my character Micah was brought up in a forest environment so the prompt was read a book with a forest setting and the bellwoods game from what i remember of the summary that i read once a couple of weeks ago it's this town where every year on or around Halloween, something like that, there's this game where all of the kids like run into the forest and there's a bell there that they have to ring and that like protects the town for another year or something like that and then obviously something goes wrong. So it's like, I don't know how much of it is going to be set in the forest itself, but the forest is at least a huge part of it. And so that's why I put it for this prompt, but yeah, I guess that's going to be my next read. And I will keep you updated on how that goes with the audiobook. So I will see y'all eventually, I guess. Hello, friends. It is the 5th at just past 10 a.m. And I have finished listening to, I was going to say reading, which, I mean, audiobooks are reading, but I finished listening to The Bellwoods Game, which I have looked up who it's by. Let me consult my thing. It's by Celia Crampion. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but that's what it looks like to me. And the audiobook is narrated by Caitlin Kelly. So, I listened to about two-thirds of it last night, and then the last third this morning, and I actually had no trouble, like, paying attention. I had it on like 2.5 speed for most of the time. Sometimes I lowered it down to two times speed, but like I was worried I wouldn't be able to follow along if I kept it at my normal speed that I like to listen to audiobooks at. Because when I read along physically, I read quite fast, so I have to have the audiobook going quite fast. But like I had no issues listening to it even without reading along. I am a little bit upset that I didn't have a physical book because apparently it's illustrated and I would have loved to see that. But um, yeah, I had a really good time. I think I would have had a slightly better time if I had more to do with my hands while I listened because like uh, at first I like had it going and I was doing like chores and stuff like sweeping and doing the dishes, stuff like that to like keep my hands busy and that was so much fun to me having the audiobook going while I did that. But then I was kind of just laying in bed the rest of the time because I, I'm like, I can't do things that require thoughts because then I would not be paying attention to the book, you know? And like, even if I were to pick up a craft, like I know my friends all who crochet will listen to audiobooks while crocheting, but I feel like that would involve too much thought because it's like counting and stuff. And so like, that's not something I could do. Uh, I ended up playing Wordscapes for a while because that requires very little thought and so I was able to do that while I was listening but um yeah I finished it and it was really cute it's um quite easy to follow along and like kind of guess where it's going but not in a bad way like predictable doesn't mean bad and if you are a fan of spooky midgrades I would recommend you pick it up because it's just all around a really good time. And if I consult my notes, that was for both readathons. The magical readathon, that was my art of illusion prompt. I don't or pick. 
I don't remember what the prompt was for that. Yeah, it, I'm blanking because I just wrote down the name of the thing. I didn't write down what the actual prompt was. Um, some of them I remember. That one I don't. Uh, the prompt for Tomes and Treasures. Where is it on my list? Oh, that was for my upbringing because my character is a forest upbringing. And it did take place about like 90% in the forest. And then the rest, it was like at school or at the main character Bailey's house. But yeah, I had a really good time. And now I definitely need to read a physical book. I think I just miss holding them in my hands. So the book that I have picked to go next is The Invocations by Crystal Sutherland. This will be my first Crystal Sutherland book and I'm so excited for it. I know Jess from the Hex Library loves Crystal Sutherland and I trust Jess wholeheartedly with her reading taste because I feel like there's only been one or two books where we've disagreed about like how it was and otherwise our tastes are very similar. And I thought this was adult but it is YA and it's gonna keep the spooky vibes going and I have this beautiful edition that has these metallic pink sprayed edges. There's also bonus content in the back, but the bonus content is for House of Hollow, which is a different book by Crystal Sutherland, which I have not read, so I can't really read the bonus content yet. It's a little bit weird that the bonus content is for a different book, but whatever. Um, this is stuck in my hair. Um, it follows three different girls, and it says three girls, one supernatural killer on the loose. So there's Zara, who is dealing with the murder of her sister, and I think she's trying to, like, raise her sister back from the dead. Then Jude is dealing with this awful, like, open wound uh, that she got from a bad deal with a demon, and so she's trying to fix that. And then there's Amir, E-M-E-R. I would pronounce that as a mirror in my head, so that's what I'll say. She's a witch and she uh, writes spells or invocations, as they're called, for other people. And um, the three of them get together, I guess, and then they have to deal with a serial killer who is killing all of Amir's past clients. That sounds pretty dang good to me. I'm very excited to get to this. It's not very long. Uh, I checked and it's just under 400 pages, so it shouldn't take me long to get through. Gosh, this cover is just gorgeous. I'm not usually one for, like, people on the cover, but I really like this one. And I'm hoping that I love it, because I hope I love every book that I read, but uh, if I love this one, then I will definitely feel more inclined to pick up other Crystal Sutherland books, which I've heard that this is a really, really good book, but that her other books are even better. So I think starting with her uh, slightly less good uh, book is the way to go for this. But this is not a prompt or a book pick for the Magical Readathon, but for the Tomes and Treasures, this is for my character's race for Tiefling, which was a queer book, and this book has lesbians, I've heard. So yeah, I will. Get started on this and update you guys when I have an update. I'm here with my first update. I've only 
only read the prologue, but like, it was so good. It starts off with, a girl walks home alone at night, and it's this very anonymous story of this girl in London going home after this Halloween party, and she like, thinks she's being followed, and it introduces us to the magic system of invocations, where apparently uh, we learn that men can't use magic, only women. Uh, it says, uh, it's impossible, men cannot use magic, this is what she's been told, this is what she has been promised, men cannot write spells, men cannot sear invocations into their skin, men cannot bind their souls to demons in exchange for power, men cannot use magic, and yet here he is. And so, like, great setup for the magic system in, like, a single paragraph but also great subversion of the magic system in the same paragraph. And I also just, like I said, it's a very anonymous thing. She's just referred to as a girl doing all of this stuff and the man doing this stuff. And I think that's so cool. Is the rest of the book in first person? I mean, not first person. Present tense is what I wanted to ask because I know the rest is in third person. Yeah. Present tense is very hit or miss for me. But I am excited. This prologue has got me so excited for this book. So I'm going to continue reading this and hopefully really enjoy it. Hello, friends. I am here to give you my halfway update of the invocations because I'm halfway through. I'm actually exactly halfway through because this book is 390 pages and I'm on page 195. I've read page 195. It is 8.14 on the 6th, Saturday. Um, I'm really enjoying this book. It's, the writing style is, like, so up my alley. It's not, like, 10 out of 10 amazing, but, like, it's really good, and I'm enjoying it a lot. I love the characters, the dynamic between our three protagonists, so... On the book, this big one is Jude. She is the one who is horribly cursed when a deal with a demon went wrong, and now she's got like this big gaping cursed wound on her, wound on her thigh. Um, this one over here, the blonde girl, is Zara. She's the one who's trying to bring her sister back from the dead. And then over here we have, I've learned it's pronounced Emer. E-M-E-R is an Irish name, and... Uh, she's the one who can write invocations. She's a curse writer, is what they're called. Um, so they are all hanging out and trying to solve this, like, murder mystery type thing. Find this serial killer and also, like, achieve their individual goals at the same time. And it's just really fun following them all around and... The magic is just really cool. I like it a lot. This is the second book I've read this month where the magic system is you make a deal with a demon and that gives you power because that's the magic system in Sorcery of Thorns too. It's a little bit different in here, but like it's the same premise, so that's pretty fun. And now at this midpoint we have, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but uh, instead of saying chapter, number, whatever, it says interval, which I'm assuming is the same thing as an interlude because it starts off the same way the prologue did with a girl walks alone at night. And I'm very excited to continue on. And I'm going to take a little bit of a break from reading. Right now Jess is sprinting and we've done one sprint, we're doing two more. So I'll be watching that for a while. But I am going to have some ice cream and I'm going to watch an episode of, what am I watching right now? Bungo Stray Dogs. I just started it. I started it a while ago and I watched the first two episodes and I really liked it and then never continued. So the other day I rewatched the first two episodes and then watched two more. So I'm on episode five of season one and it's, it's good. I'm not like loving it, but it gives me something to watch when I... I'm in the mood for that, so I will be watching that while I eat my ice cream, and then I will get back to reading once I'm done with my episode and my ice cream. So I will probably see you after I finish this book, so whenever that is, I will be seeing you.
Hello, friends. It is a quarter after midnight. I stayed up so that I could finish reading the invocations. I did, in fact, finish it. Uh, I've been reading pretty much nonstop for the past however many hours it's been since I updated you. I think I updated you at like seven. Mm, yikes. <laughs> Maybe eight. I don't know. I've been reading for many hours is the uh, situation. As you can tell, I'm very tired, but I wanted to give you my thoughts while I still had them. Um, I might do what I usually do when I finish a book really late and give you my thoughts here and then like explain better in the morning, but also I might not. We'll see. Uh, I loved this book. I thought it was fantastic. The only thing that I think could have made it better is if it was polyamorous because there was a little bit there where I'm like, hmm, are they all going to be gay and in love? But that was not the case. It is still very gay though. Um, but yeah, it was so good. I really enjoyed how everything all came together because you have... So, like, I read the tagline on the back is three girls, one supernatural killer on the loose. So you have this, like, murder mystery going on, this serial killer they're trying to find. But then there's also, um, in Emer's backstory, her entire family was killed ten years ago. So you have, like, that in the background. And the book, after the halfway point, it gives you, like bits and pieces of the characters figuring out that murder, the the 10 years ago murder. And it's like, they know it's connected to the present day murders, they just have no idea how. And I was figuring things out like slightly ahead of when the information was revealed to the characters, like I was picking up on the hints. And then as soon as there was like the big reveal to the characters about who killed Emer's family, I was just like, oh, based off of that, I know who the modern day killer is. And I was correct in my guess on that. So go me, I'm doing great. I really like how this is about family in like a blood way, but also like a chosen family kind of way. It's really fun. Of course, I love that this is a book about grief because if we know anything about me, I love books about grief. And this does it very well. I am pretty sure that's a theme in all of Crystal Sutherland's books, as far as I'm aware. But this is the first one I've read, so I'm not positive on that. That's just what I know from, like, hearing about her other books. This is her fourth book, I believe. And I would love to read her other three. I think I would adore them if they're even better than this one, which is what the general consensus is. Uh, one detail that... I think is really cool is Jude's family and all their names. So she is the sixth child of this rich guy and he has four kids from his first marriage and they're like Adam and Seth and stuff and then his second marriage, it, they're like all older and then his second marriage he had a son named Elijah, who goes by Eli, and then Jude is the child of his third marriage, and her name is Jude, but we find out in the second half of the book that that's short for Judith. And so they're all biblical names, and that's like very important when you like get more into the book. But Judith is a story that's like very near and dear to my heart. I really love the story of Judith. It's I okay. Let me gather my thoughts. So I really like old stories and I grew up in the church so I know a lot of biblical stories. The story of Judith is a semi-canonical biblical story. It's not in most versions of the Bible but there are some like orthodox sects of Christianity who consider it to be a canon book of the Bible and basically Judith is this Jewish woman she uh is a widow her i think her husband is killed during the like overtaking of the city they live in by this man 
Holofernes, perhaps is how it's pronounced, something like that. And um, stuff happens, Judith ends up killing this man Holofernes, and in some translations he's like someone who sexually assaults her, so it's like very personal, it's not just him taking over her home, but there's a lot of artwork of that scene of her killing him, and it's always just really hit me. There's one, I can't think of the artist's name. If I feel like it when I'm editing this vlog, I will look it up and put it on the screen, but it's a painting of Judith beheading Holofernes, except the artist painted herself into the portrait as well, and she gave Holofernes the face of the man who assaulted her, so it's a very personal piece, a very visceral piece to look at, and it's just absolutely stunning, but um, I just feel like how that kind of plays into things was so cool to me for someone who knows these stories but yeah those are my thoughts i really really loved this book and i'm so glad i read it as for my next book i think i'm ready to take on the beast that is beautiful nightmares by kj Sutton, the fourth book in the fortuna sworn series which Everand tells me is 900 something pages, but oh, I have the hiccups. I've stayed up way too late. Uh, all of the Goodreads versions, like the ebook on Goodreads, says it's 600 something pages. So I don't know what's up with that discrepancy. But I'm like, you know what? I read a physical book. I can go back to reading my many ebooks that I have on my TBR for the month, and I'm ready to tackle this big boy. So that will be my next read and I am nervous because it's so big and also continuing a series and I'm always worried when I continue a series that I'm not gonna love it as much as I loved the previous books but I'm also very excited because I'm continuing a series that I really enjoy so I am going to go to bed but I will start that book tomorrow and I will see you whenever it is that I see you guys next. Editing Mars here. Uh, apparently my video is too large to export. It is, like, well over an hour and a half long. My editing software stopped telling me how long it was, so I'm going to insert this clip at some point and just split this vlog in two. So I don't know after what book I'm going to split it, but uh, I guess that's the end of part one of my April readathons vlog. If you've enjoyed it, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. You can subscribe to my channel to make sure you get to see part two. And I will see you guys whenever that happens.